<clears throat> I just wanted to say uh, hello and good morning. And thank you very much for inviting me uh, to this workshop. And I'm really sorry I couldn't be there in person. And I also wanted to convey my solidarity uh, with all of you and everyone affected by the tragic events in Paris. So Yohanan asked me to give an overview of decadal climate variability in the historical record. Is my talk up now? Sorry, we're just getting the slides up. The slides are okay. Good. Okay, so I'm going to keep my remarks uh, very simple, and uh, the hope is that um, I'll make a few overarching points that will hopefully be useful uh, as you delve into much more detail over the course of the workshop. So I'm just trying to put us on the same page um, and make a few simple points about uh, the challenges. Um, um, to uh, identifying and understanding decadal variability in the observed record. So you've already heard some of this this morning. I had a chance to listen in on a few of the talks using the live streaming, which is working very well. So first, motivation, of course, why do we care about decadal climate variability? Uh, of course, there are profound societal impacts. We've seen that it adds uncertainty to projections of climate in the coming decades. And we've also seen examples of how it confounds the detection and attribution of past climate change. So plenty of motivation. So I'd like to highlight some of the challenges to defining and understanding decadal climate variability in the observational record. So I'm just talking about the last 150 years or so uh, when we do have uh, instrumental uh, data. So the first point I'll try to make is that these patterns of decadal climate variability tend to be global in scale. And that can make it difficult to sort out the causal linkages uh, between different regions. So I think that's a real challenge uh, that we confront. Then secondly, of course, uh, the data are sparse. And, um, and the records are short compared to the time scales of interest. Um, and then finally, because of this, it may be very difficult to distinguish decadal climate variability from a random process, a white noise or a red noise process. And just to caution everyone, uh, when we look at records, especially um, short records or even the paleoclimate records, and we uh, low-pass filter the data, we're always going to see decadal variability. But this may not be physically meaningful. It may not reflect a physical process that's operating on the decadal time scale. So caution when just uh, assuming that a, even though a low-pass filter time series shows variability, it doesn't mean that there's any physical uh, underpinnings. And then uh, finally, uh, I will go through what the main phenomena are of decadal climate variability, and I'll split this up amongst the three uh, main ocean basins. So the first thing is to uh, bring us back to the actual data coverage with which we have to look at this problem. And of course, the oceans are primary in, the, in decadal climate variability. So I'd like to show you a few maps of data coverage from the ICOADS data set, which is primarily a compilation of merchant ship uh, uh, data from merchant ships that we use to uh, look at this issue. So these are some maps of the uh, showing uh, the percent of time or the percentage of months um, in each grid square that had at least one observation in each of these 20-year periods. 
So the upper left that has the black box around it, that's for the 20 year period from 1860 to 1879. And you can see these ship tracks very well defined, uh, mainly in the Atlantic and also in the Indian Ocean, South Indian Ocean, but really uh, very, almost no coverage in the rest of the oceans. So really the Atlantic and part of the Indian Ocean is is uh, all we can look at so far back in time. Uh, the coverage gets a little bit better as we step through the various 20-year uh, periods, but again, the Atlantic remains the, the, uh, the best um, measured uh, of the ocean basins. And even uh, from the 1920s on, we can see filling in of data for the Northern Hemisphere, but the Southern Hemisphere and the tropics also remains uh, under-observed or not observed as well as we would like. And then finally, the most recent 20-year period, things are pretty well covered except for the Southern Ocean. So this is a basic constraint. And of course, these data go into all of the reanalyses that we use. For example, the 20th century reanalysis or the soda ocean, simple ocean data assimilation. Uh, but again, we're fundamentally constrained with uh, where the data are um, from these ships. I'd just like to uh, just give you a pointer to, to a, a resource, the Climate Data Guide, which can provide um, uh, information on climate data sets written by the people in the community who have expertise in particular data sets. And we, uh, I think as a community, this is a very useful way of compiling our knowledge of these data sets um, <clears throat> to, uh, to make use of in our studies. Okay, so defining patterns of decadal climate variability. I'd like to just start very, very simply uh, and show that you don't actually have to do anything too fancy with the data to see uh, variability. So again, I'm just trying to put us all on the same page. I know we come from different backgrounds in this workshop. So we can look at a map of sea surface temperature. This happens to be the one uh, from a particular day, 29th of December in 2011. And when you look at the map, you see the usual patterns um, with uh, uh, changes with latitude, and then you see the warm pool in the Western Pacific and Indian Ocean but it's very hard to see anything beyond the uh, mean seasonal cycle. So of course we uh, subtract uh, the long-term mean for this particular day, and when we do that, then patterns emerge. So these are the anomalies for this particular day relative to the long-term mean, and we can see uh, large-scale patterns. There's large-scale organization even on a daily map of sea surface temperature. And I've just highlighted here in the box uh, a pattern that uh, has been mentioned, of course, many times already, the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. And you can even see this, in, this signature of these large-scale patterns also in the Atlantic, even on a single day. And I think this is really important to be able to see these patterns without a lot of um, st statistical analysis. So moving on, uh, looking at the Pacific Basin and decadal climate variability in the Pacific Basin, I'm just going to show you results based on one of the many SST data sets that we have. Um, this is the HAD-I SST starting in 1870 and going through the end of last year. And uh, I'll be showing you uh, just the leading EOF of monthly sea surface temperature anomalies where we've subtracted the global mean SST. And this is the typical practice, and I've highlighted some of the studies below, uh, where we want to remove some estimate of the forced response, and that's why the global mean SST is removed. And then what we're looking at is the variability about that. Um, long-term warming trend. So this is a familiar pattern, I know, to uh, probably everyone in the room. The leading EOF of sea surface temperature anomalies in this box over the North Pacific. 
and we're showing it as a global regression map of the SST anomalies regressed onto the principal component time series um, of the data in that box. And this mode explains 25% of the raw monthly SST anomalies. So it's a leading mode, well separated for the sec from the second and higher order modes. But again, it only explains a quarter of the variance. So there's plenty of other patterns uh, that are also um, contributing uh, to North Pacific SST variability. And it's very nice to see this correspondence between this pattern that's derived from 100 years plus of data with this map that uh, uh, for a single day. And again, that can give you confidence that uh, the statistical analysis really is uh, rooted in the patterns that we see in the data. So of course, it's very important to look at the sensitivity of patterns to the uh, domain of interest, uh, to, to variations in the, in the domain. So if you look at the EOF using the full or pan-Pacific domain, uh, you see a very similar pattern and explains maybe a little bit more of the variance. But you see, of course, that the uh, region in the eastern equatorial Pacific really dominates in terms of amplitude for this pattern. And this is, of course, the ENSO pattern with its teleconnections uh, to remote regions from the tropical Pacific. And um, there's a uh, high uh, spatial correspondence, of course, between this uh, Pacific decadal oscillation or ENSO-like pattern with the ENSO pattern itself, except for this uh, different uh, relative magnitudes between the tropics and the extratropics. And this PDO pattern is very similar to the interdecadal Pacific oscillation, which is defined um, as the leading EOF when you low pass filter the data. But I'm emphasizing here that we haven't done any time filtering, so we haven't built in any, any uh, particular time scale into these analyses. So here are the time series of the principal components uh, of these two EOF patterns. And the one on the top is for this North Pacific uh, region and then the Pan Pacific region below. Uh, and all records go from 1870 to 2014. And again, these are the raw monthly SST anomalies. And you can already see that the North Pacific really has a much lower frequency character compared to this Pan Pacific, which is really dominated by the Eastern Tropical Pacific. And if you do a power spectrum of these two uh, time series that's shown here on the left, um, and the years are shown on the top uh, x-axis there, you can really see that the North Pacific is dominated by low frequency variability that is not well resolved in a record that is only 100 plus years. And then this Pan-Pacific record is dominated by the interannual and so phenomenon. So now I'd like to turn to the Atlantic. Um, and again, many of, much of this has been mentioned before. Um, so again, using the same uh, approach of looking at uh, the SST from monthly SST from which the global mean has been subtracted. And in this case, we're not uh, the community. Uh, you can do an EOF analysis, but even more simply, you can just take the SST anomalies in this box of the North Atlantic and average that and then use that as an index to regress the data onto. And that's what's shown here. So the top map is showing you, um, the, the box is showing you the region that's uh, used and then the spatial expression of that globally um, through regression ana analysis. And then the time series of SST in that box is shown in the lower panel. And again, emphasizing these are the raw monthly SST anomalies. And even uh, without doing any filtering, there's a very pronounced uh, multi-decadal component. And you notice a strong out-of-phase relationship between the North and South Atlantic. And then a PDO-like pattern 
uh, that's occurring in uh, the Pacific uh, Basin. And uh, if you compare the time series of the PDO, the leading EOF of the North Pacific, and inverting the sign of the Atlantic multidecadal oscillation, you can see that there's a uh, tantalizing, perhaps, uh, relationship uh, between the two. And I think this is also a major challenge that we need to confront. Uh, hopefully, uh, there will be many discussions in this workshop. Just what is the physical meaning of a possible uh, relationship between these two indices? Uh, the maximum correlation is something like 0.5 when the AMO leads the PDO by about a decade or so. But again, emphasizing these are very short records and this lead lag relationship is apparent maybe in the second half of the record, but it's really uh, not so apparent in the first half. So again, it really puts into question how robust are these relationships and what, and if they are, what are the physical meaning behind them. So finally, turning to the Southern Ocean, which uh, I'm not sure we've uh, touched on yet in the workshop. Here I'm showing you the, the data coverage um, over the Southern Ocean as a function of time. So this is the percent of grid boxes uh, between 50 and 70 south uh, over the ocean um, that had at least uh, one observation. Um, and this is broken up uh, by season. And the important thing here is that really data coverage really only uh, passes this 50% threshold in about 1950. And not surprisingly, it's really the austral summer season when uh, the data coverage is highest. So really, when we look at Southern Ocean SSTs, what we're really looking at are, is the summertime, first of all. And then secondly, uh, we really have to be careful about how far back in time we look at, uh, we look at the data, even in reanalyses because there really isn't much coverage uh, before mid-century. And so this is the final map here showing um, Southern Ocean SST record um, from 1950 to 2014. Again, the raw monthly anomalies. And then the top panel is the regression map onto this Southern Ocean SST time series shown by the box. And again, uh, once again, we're getting these global patterns, very uh, strong connection with a PDO-like pattern, and some connection to an AMO-like uh, pattern. And uh, finally, you can uh, compare the Southern Ocean time series up at the top from 1950 on with the PDO and then the inverted sign of the AMO and again, for the second half of the record, uh, the decadal variability in all three is very striking and uh, uh, very similar. And uh, whereas in the first half, I would say that's not the case. So again, caution when we're just looking at phenomena that have such long time scales when we really only have uh, very short records. So I'm wrapping up here um, in my time allotted. I'd like to um, highlight um, a very nice uh, book that came out of a meeting a, uh, a couple of years ago. And this uh, climate change, multi-decadal and beyond has 23 chapters on a wide range of topics. And for those not familiar with some of, some of the topics, I uh, highly recommend, um, recommend this book. So final remarks, um, issues and challenges for understanding decadal climate variability in the historical record. And I just want to uh, bring up the three patterns that I've highlighted. Of course, there are many more, and you can go into much more detail on the types of um, objective analysis that you do on the data. But I think in the end, it probably boils down to <laughs> Uh, these patterns that no matter where you start from, the North Pacific, the North Atlantic, or the Southern Ocean, you're actually seeing very much of the same thing. 
And this then really brings up the issue of the global connectivity uh, amongst these different phenomena and makes it, I, in my view, quite difficult to sort out the causal linkages uh, between the basins. And really, maybe we should really think about the global, the glo the global uh, mode or structure of variability. Uh, highlighting, again, sparse observational data and short records really calls into question how robust these patterns are. And then, of course, uh, makes it very difficult to probe uh, the mechanisms. And then uh, just like to highlight that uh, we really, I think, need to uh, have a view that these patterns could be just an expression of random uh, red noise phenomena uh, with, with some contribution from deterministic uh, ocean pro processes. But I think both are probably contributing, and it's not an either or uh, situation. And I think really to make progress, um, as you'll do this week in the workshop, I think it's very nice to see the um, synergy um, of combining the observations, the paleoclimate records, and the modeling. So thank you very much. Or can I hear them? So Clara, thank you very much for this very clear uh, presentation of the historical record and what it tells us. And would you stay connected to us so if we have some questions you can uh, answer. I wanted to say that we can start now the uh, discussion session uh, with uh, maybe more specific questions to Clara and then uh, questions to what else we heard today in the meeting and uh, points that we can carry with, with us for tomorrow and for the future work on Bikeda climate variability. Um, so are there any specific questions to Clara or general questions about the subject, we, subjects we heard today? Well, maybe, maybe I can ask uh, one brief questions to Clara in, in following up her talk. Um, how much, because so, Clara emphasized the fact of the, these global patterns and the fact that they are not foreign to one another, that they have some connection between them. Um, and, and I wanted to ask, how much could we see that the anthropogenic uh, forcing that we are imposing on the climate is maybe the cause or partial cause for the connection between the different uh, patterns that we were looking at. Is there any reason to suspect something like that or, or, uh, or not, essentially? Well, I guess what I showed, I, I had subtracted the global mean SST. So in a way, I view that as removing the forced component. Um, so I was hoping that that would, you know, take out that element um, of why the patterns might be connected. Okay, so I, I missed it, so I apologize. Yes, uh, Ed. Hi, Clara. Very good talk. Hi, Ed. Um, I'm kind of curious. The, sim the similarity in the uh, in those uh, leading modes is quite striking, uh, and yet yeah. this is all based on a um, like an optimal analysis of the observations using methods that I think Alexi Kaplan first uh, uh, described in the 1990s. I think they had a ISST uh, mm -hmm. data used the same basic methods. Is there any chance that that, that the method of analysis to create the full field of SSTs could in some sense be pushing the, yeah. the appearance of similarity uh, uh, in a way that is in some sense statistically kind of ordained. Uh, I'm just, what, what's your thought about that? Yeah, that's a great question and um, I actually kick myself for not uh, making these maps based on uh, a data set such as the Hadley SST. 
uh, which does not have any filling in of the missing grid boxes. So it would not be subject to these, uh, this uh, possible uh, issue that you're, that you're talking about. Uh, but I guess if my memory serves, and we have made these maps based on the uninterpolated data sets, we do find similar uh, connections uh, amongst the basins. And I'm not saying that these are, um, I'm just saying that this is what we observe for this very short snapshot of decadal variability that we can look at in the data. And uh, whether this is a robust uh, aspect or not, I think we really have to use the paleo records and then the models to, to really get at this. Yeah, Rowan, Rowan has a question. Uh, hi, Clara. Just a small question. I wondered if you'd like to say something about the Indian Ocean. You didn't say too much about that, and uh, maybe you'd like to. <laughs> Thank you, Rowan. Yeah, I thought about it. Um, I guess I found that the Indian Ocean was very, uh, at least in this type of uh, analysis, seemed to go along very much with uh, the Pacific. And, um, and you could see that in all of the maps. Um, there is fairly good, uh, quite good data coverage in the Indian Ocean back in the uh, early decades of the data sets. So it's a very important region. It also has a very large signal to noise in terms of decadal versus interannual variability. So it is a key region, I think, for us to, to look at uh, for the decadal variability. But I didn't notice that it had any distinct uh, decadal, decadal variability that was distinct from what we were seeing uh, in the Pacific. I, I guess one question might be, we tend to think of obviously the Indian Ocean responding to ENSO variability on interannual timescales, and a question might be whether the relationship between the Pacific and the Indian Ocean is, is just the same on decadal timescales as it is on interannual timescales, or whether it has some interestingly different features, and if so, what they might be. Yeah, I uh, maybe not up on the most recent literature, but when I had looked at the, this back in the paper in 2004, I found actually that the Indian Ocean had a very strong connection to the North Pacific, uh, not only in the ocean, but in the atmosphere on the decadal timescales. And it was actually that linkage was stronger than with the equatorial Pacific uh, SSTs. Um, Matt Newman, in his uh, talk later this week on the PDO, I think he may bring in some of those, uh, some of that aspect as well. That's a good question. Hello, Clara. It's Karina. Um, Hi. <laughs> I have uh, just a question. Uh, we had a question today already on this for the hiatus and, and the role of the seasonality for hiatus. So I'm wondering if, uh, because we, we ignore more or less by looking at those patterns, the seasonal cycle. So there are two questions I have on this. The first is uh, what can be the role or the key element maybe to, to look, to take into account the, the seasonal cycle. And second would be, do we maybe, um, take out uh, this connection because we do not properly remove the seasonal cycle because we look at this anomaly. Because it's also an issue people really ignore that we are maybe not properly removing the seasonal cycle. So what we are removing is maybe not the right thing. So these are two questions then. <laughs> okay, um, I guess my impression is that of course, there is some variation in the spatial patterns of SST variability between the seasons. Um, and also because of the different mixed layer depths, the time scales of these patterns may be uh, a little bit, a little bit uh, nuanced or a little bit uh, distinct. Um, and also in terms of how the ocean and the atmosphere couple, uh, they may have different strengths of coupling in the different seasons. But despite uh, all of that, I think that these patterns, at least that we've 
I've shown um, on the decadal time scale, I don't think that they are too sensitive to the seasonal cycle, but I'd be interested to hear other people's uh, views on that. Yep, uh, please, uh, other speakers from today or anybody else can chime in from their own experience and answer the questions or ask new questions and so on. Uh, hi, Clara. I'd um, just like to move the target a bit from observation to modeling. You've shown these very st strong patterns um, in the observations. Uh, you've also shown from your own work and work of others that if you look at regional trends, you can have a wide range of uh, different decadal trends and, and variability at the regional levels when you look at models and you know, big ensembles. Now, what's your perception of how do the models reproduce these particular patterns that you have shown? Do they have the right spatial structure? Do they have the right time scale of variability? Or, or do they just reproduce the case of variability on spatial scales or, or time scales which are actually different from what we see in, in the observation? That's a great question, and uh, I hope many other people in the room are going to uh, answer this, but I'll, <clears throat> I'll just say a few words of my impressions from the models. Uh, but there has been a lot of work um, uh, looking at this. I think in general, this Pacific pattern, um, I don't know if they're seeing my slide here, um, but the, it's okay, actually. Uh, the Pacific pattern, um, the models are generally deficient in the magnitude of the decadal scale component in the tropics, in the tropical Pacific. So the linkages between the tropical Pacific and the extra tropics is, I would say, underestimated in the models uh, for the most part. Um, regarding the connection between the North Atlantic and the Pacific, um, I think I'm not quite as familiar about how the models do that, but I believe that there's quite a diversity uh, in terms of how strong the linkage is between the tropical Pacific and the North Atlantic uh, between models. And Southern Ocean, I'm really not very familiar. Probably Mojib uh, can speak to that, um, uh, that aspect. Anyone else uh, here? Uh can comment about how the models are doing. Do the models show a similar behavior? Yeah, but maybe you can make a comment uh, today. Preempt your own talk. <laughs> we'll excuse you for that. From the, I was going to show some of those pictures tomorrow uh, related to AMOC variability and relationship with AMV. But AMOC variability in the models, both in their time scales and spatial structures, quite different among the coupled models. And similarly, AMV structure uh, is quite different, again, uh, among the uh, models. So there's quite a bit of diversity. Yeah, Tom, uh, Tom Delworth. Oh, it's okay. Tom Delworth. Uh, one. I was just going to add to uh, Gokhan's comment that in the Atlantic, I think a, a real central challenge is that many models simulate interesting low frequency variability associated with a subpolar gyre. But the connections with the tropical Atlantic are highly variable, and many models have very weak expressions that vary in the tropical Atlantic. And yet, many simulation studies have shown that, in fact, it's that tropical North Atlantic piece which is, has really strong impact on the global climate system. So I think there's a real challenge, and, and you, you can ask questions why that is. Are there missing physical processes? Is it uh, dust from the Sahara? Is it cloud feedback? Is it resolution scales in the Atlantic? Who knows? But I think that is a central challenge. It's a challenge because if you, even if you can predict the decadal scale variation of the AMOC and its connection with AMB, 
if you can predict that tropical Atlantic piece, I think your ability to predict continental scale impacts goes way up. So I think that's a central challenge. I, I actually wanted to ask Ed, I can't, Ed Hawkins. And in, in your talk of uncertainty, you essentially refer to model uncertainty, but Clara showed us that there is a tremendous amount of observational uncertainty um, too. So how, how do we really incorporate it when we study decade of variability and use both models and observations to, to understand the phenomena? Good question. Um, I, I think one of the points is to try and compare like with like. I mean, it's one of the points I tried to bring out at the end of my talk was to, you know, if, if we're looking at observed SSTs, we need to compare with simulated SSTs, not necessarily, you know, with, with the air temperatures, which is what we tend to do. So I think that's one important point. Uh, you know, I, I don't quite know how to bring in the observational uncertainty into separating sources of uncertainty, but, you know, we, we do have to use more than one observational data set whenever we can because they're all constructed slightly differently. So we, we certainly need to take, take all these factors into consideration. Does that answer your question? Um, to some extent, yes. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, Karina has uh, another question up here. Or comment. Okay. That's perfectly only close by, huh? <laughs> Do we have another microphone that can, somebody else can run around with? Um, okay, I, I would like to comment on your question because I think this is one more or less the, one of the uh, um, points within concept heat. So, is, is in particular, this question. So, first, I think one answer would be to compare that the range or the size of uncertainty are different for model and for observations. So maybe the ranges are bigger, so the observations, of course, they have uncertainties, but they are maybe that smaller. And this is exactly what is done. You have to do the, all those intercomparison ex experiments, and you have to define scientific questions, what you want to resolve, and what, what you are resolving, f for which uncertainties you want to have for what. So this is a completely different approach for different questions. So if you look at the yeah, decadal climate variability, it is important to develop those intercomparison inter exercises for observations as well as for models, depending on your research questions. And there's a lot of on going on already, so as a recommendation. Good, because I, I, I noticed that when we plot, for example, we saw several uh, graphs today where, where we show the observations in the cloud of model uncertainty. but. We don't really show very well the, the observational uncertainty that is involved and how does that change our, our ability to compare models and data. So uh, that's, that's one, yeah. one place where we have this kind of... Uh, yeah, it's a, it's, it's especially something we have pointed out that, that there's a need for the observations to do this. So there's one way going forward as has shown by Clara with a, uh, um, with a climate data guide so that you accumulate information for the first. And second, that you also start these intercomparison experiments, which are public also, for the observation side. And there's a great need. So there's also already something ongoing under GSOP Cliver for the historical data set, for example, for the in situ data. But you have to do this with all the other products. There's a great need on doing this. It's something we have identified and we try to push uh, work in this direction. So I completely agree, uh, but this has already been identified. Uh, there is down here, Brad, Brad Winsley. Thank you. I just want to change the topic a little bit, Clark. Uh, this is Brad Lindsley. Can I ask you a question about your, I guess, your opinion about the um, the relationship between ENSO and the PDO in the Pacific? Well, there's, I've heard some discussions about the potentially large, very large El Nino events triggering phase shifts in the PDO, or I just wonder what your thoughts would be about the processes and the problems we're having. Um, I'm going to highlight Matt Newman's talk coming up 
because uh, <clears throat> a bunch of us have um, participated in a review paper on the PDO, and the views put forth there with, um, I think, some good evidence is um, that maybe this PDO phenomenon is actually consisting of several, uh, maybe four different processes. And um, <clears throat> the connections between them, uh, the linkages between them are, um, uh, with linkages between them, um, uh, but maybe not to think of it as a single phenomenon that has this spatial structure. Um, as far as uh, triggering shifts of the PDO, I think ENSO could be one way, but there are also other ways, I think, that you could trigger shifts of the PDO. <clears throat> I don't know if anyone else has comments on that. I guess we have a... We, I don't want to, you know, Matt and other people are going to talk on this uh, in the Pacific... Uh, Variability session. So we'll leave this as an open question uh, till I think it's Wednesday or something like that. I, well, I could jump in with another question. And, and uh, with us, two people here uh, spoke or specifically about the climate system response to external forcing, uh, not anthropogenic forcing, but uh, natural uh, forcing like solar and, and volcanoes. And I, wanted to ask, maybe this question can be asked in two ways. To what extent is what we see in the observation reflecting some of these external forcings? And the other question is, okay, so if those, those are completely natural internal modes to the uh, climate system when, uh, coming from interactions within the climate system components, how much do we have to consider these global modes when we look at the response to solar and volcanic volcanoes? So. Uh, I would like to, to ask the people who, yeah, or other people, or anybody else, yeah. Uh, it's, it's more a remark than a question following on this. I think there are, so there are more and more issues on the volcanic impact on TKL viability, I think, more and more papers, but also more and more papers on weaker volcanoes than what we thought up to now, tropospheric volcanoes as opposed to stratospheric volcanoes, as the one Davide has shown. So there are more and more papers in the, in the hiatus uh, literature, but more generally, people tend to think now that these volcanoes also have an impact on the climate viability, and also volcanoes coming from the high latitudes, not only the tropical ones. So it's, it's just an, I just <laughs> send this to the world, and. I relate this to Gavin's talk on updating the CMIP-5 forcing. I wonder if this shouldn't be taken into account also for future scenarios or like future scenarios of the past climate. Thanks. So uh, there, is a, uh, th there is a lot of work being done on updating the volcano parts in the CMIP-6 scenarios. And um, one of the things that uh, at least some of the groups will be moving towards is modeling uh, volcanoes using point emissions at the, at the appropriate height as opposed to using uh, you know, a stratospheric aerosol optical depth, which traditionally people have done. Um, and uh, that uh, is a way to totally unify uh, both the, the other kinds of sulfate forcing, uh, but also the tropospheric um, and stratospheric uh, ending ones. And so you can put in, you know, however high it goes, and you can just see what impact it has. Uh, the, uh, the tests that we've run uh, indicate that the, if you put in a, an SO2 source and you just allow uh, your normal chemistry to, uh, to take it and, and move with it, um, you, get, uh, uh, you get stratospheric aerosol patterns. As long as you have a, a reasonable stratospheric circulation, that looks um, that looks as uh, uh, you know quite good compared to the observations, and of course you can use that going back much further than the satellite era, which right now you know a lot of the volcanoes, particularly in the in the last millennium runs, um, there's a lot of inconsistencies in how those are being modelled right now. So I, I think things will be moving forward uh, in, and doing things in a more coherent uh, and synthetic way uh, in the next time around.
Uh, I just want to ask a question about volcanic eruptions and these uh, mode of variability. Uh, up till now, the scientists uh, agreed that there is no physical relationship between uh, the eruptions and the ENSO. And they, they think that we have to remove the ENSO impact when we are going to study uh, the volcanic impact. So my question is, like, uh, there was a talk that uh, these volcanic eruptions can enhance the NO, like they can, in, in the stratosphere, they can bring the NO towards positive phase. And we think that, okay, if they can enhance the NO, there could be some relationship between ENSO and the NO. So when the, the scientists think that we have to get rid of ENSO, so they simply apply the regression and they remove the ENSO signal. But how much we are sure that when we are applying the, the, this regression, we are removing the NO as well, which we think that could be the reason uh, because of the eruptions. So how certain we are that while doing this eruption, uh, I mean, while doing this regression, we are removing ENSO, but uh, on the other side, we could also remove the NO signal as well. So that means our results could be, I mean, like uncertain. So do we have any idea how to get rid of ENSO if this is not the, the cause, it's not caused by eruptions? So then how to remove ENSO efficiently uh, without getting rid of NO that is caused by eruption? I'm pretty sure I never said that we should or do anything like removing ENSO to understand the response. <clears throat> the problem I would say is rather than it is quite uncertain still how Tropical Pacific responds to strong volcanic eruption. So it depends actually also in which kind of model framework you put yourself to understand that. Because, for example, earlier studies um, based on this dynamic thermostat mechanism suggested a positive ENSO phase uh, after uh, strong eruptions, but it seems not to be at work in more complex climate models. And uh, on the other hand, we have reconstruction suggesting that uh, there is a positive ENSO phase. So I think it's a matter of understanding how the Tropical Pacific. Uh, response to strong volcanic eruption rather than to say, okay, we have to get rid of the tropic response, that because it is uncertain. So that's my point on this. Uh, any other questions? And I'd like to remind you that I, I avoided questions in the morning, so if people still remember points that they want to ask about for the morning uh, speakers. Uh. Um, can I just ask something else about the volcanic response? So, I mean, there's this understanding that this NAO mechanism is perhaps important, but it's not always found in all models. Um, and there seem to be some simulations that give an ocean response, but that's not linked to the NAO, maybe just through a direct surface cooling. So I wonder if you could comment on uh, the state of knowledge about those issues, uh, how robust the NAO response really is, and whether other, other mechanisms of ocean response are likely to be important or not. First of all, I would say that this uh, NAO plus uh, kind of response is kind of uh, robust in the observations, and I think the mechanism is uh, rather clear. And it's uh, basically the downward propagation of this strengthened polar vortex. And <coughs> sorry, yeah, the models. The problem is that the models don't get that as robustly as uh, one would expect. But uh, the possible reasons are several. One is again the forcing, how we implement the forcing in the model. And uh, actually, in the case of uh, uh, reconstructed events, just talking, for example, about last millennium, okay, we are using kind of very simplified approaches to implement the forcing. So we have this AOD latitudinal bands, for example, and uh, the response in the stratosphere is kind of washed out, this dynamical response uh, linked to the um, thermal radiation. On the other hand, there are uh, limitations in the model characteristics. For example, uh, troposphere-stratosphere coupling may be not sufficiently well represented in the model just because of the low resolution, vertical resolution of the model. So uh, we have to understand that. And I hope that uh, coordinated modeling activities like uh, this one will help to uh, answer 
uh, question related to this fact. Concerning <coughs> the oceanic response, okay, the NAO is one point. There are contrasting evidences about uh, in the model world uh, about how the other modes, respond, atmospheric modes like the PDO, uh, sorry, the PNA response to the uh, to volcanic forcing. But uh, we shouldn't neglect the fact that, uh, for example, already these, uh, um, the anomaly that are induced, I'm talking about uh, tropical eruption, uh, mostly on di direct uh, relative forcing effect uh, on the surface, this cooling uh, reduces the meridional temperature gradient, which leads to an effect also in the stratosphere. So we can think also about the uh, uh, response uh, in terms of the coupled ocean system that ocean atmosphere system that is independent of this direct um, forcing from the stratosphere. Um, first of all, I would like to make a comment on this statement about the vertical resolution in the stratosphere. I hear a lot of times people saying, oh, you know, we don't get the linkages between the stratosphere and the troposphere because we don't have enough resolution. Now, in the ECM that we have modeled, we don't have a very good stratosphere, troposphere uh, links. Uh, we haven't actually explored the volcanic aerosol issue in strong depth, but you know, we are thinking about a range of phenomena. And still, we have 137 levels in our model. Um, Metophis model has over 80 levels. Um, my impression, it's hard for me to believe that it's only an issue of, of vertical resolution. There have been experiments done recently increasing the vertical resolution very much in the stratosphere within the SPECS project. And also we have tested the impact of vertical resolution in the stratosphere. You definitely get a much better description of the stratospheric variability. So if you look at the QBO, for example, that's much better if you increase the vertical resolution. But you don't necessarily get the, the connection between the stratosphere and the, stropo, and the troposphere better just by increasing the vertical resolution. So either we really need an order of magnitude <coughs> or levels, we don't know, but in the sort of range that we are using at the moment, at least in uh, numerical weather prediction, it doesn't seem so obvious to me that just increasing the vertical resolution in the stratosphere automatically, or, or it's the main factor in, in reproducing these connections. Um, the other question I, I wanted to ask actually refers to another talk this morning, uh, the one by uh, Karina on, on the energy budget and the ocean heat storage. And, and she reminded us at the beginning of the talk that actually only a few percent of the imbalance, energy imbalance at the top of the atmosphere actually goes in the atmosphere itself. Most of it, the vast majority goes in the ocean and therefore if we actually look at the ocean heat storage that's a much better way of relating uh, basically the energy budget to, to the imbalance in, in, uh, um, at the top of the atmosphere. However, we do live in the air and we do live on the continents. And therefore the question is, do we, as far as the heat, which is actually basically the changes in near surface and air temperature over the continent, Do we think that that is actually directly related to this 3% of the energy imbalance? Or is rather related to the amount of heat that the ocean gives back to the atmosphere? And that may actually depend, in my opinion, much more on the patterns that Clara has actually shown, uh, rather than the what actually comes from the top of the atmosphere or basically the, the, the radiative balance. So th there's no doubt that in the long-term trend, um, 
there is a relationship between all these variables. But I'm wondering on, on the decadal time scale, when we look at the basically the, the, the big temperature anomalies over a large part of, of the continents, uh, are these anomalies directly related to this 3% or are they more related to how this decadal mode of variability managed to extract this heat that goes into the ocean and bring it back to the atmosphere? Who's answering this? Uh, <laughs> that is, that's what we are wondering. Maybe Karina can say something. Yeah. I think I cannot answer this 100%. <laughs> But uh, I think, uh, yes, I agree. I think you're completely right, because the inventory which has been done and where it has been announced that the storage of energy from this accumulation of energy in the climate system is predominantly in the ocean. It's, it's, it's an inventory which has been done for the long-term trend. On the other hand, you, you have to differentiate between the internal climate forcing and the external climate forcing. And um, we, we have tried uh, to, to discuss this inventory in this paper on the discussion. And uh, our first figure shows the figure which has been shown in the IPCC on the different climate forcing in order get, to get also more of the time scales on this climate forcing. So I, I would give the first answer would be yes. And it, it's a question of time scales. And, um, and if you look at climate variability, you would not look at an inventory. So I think these are two different issues you are discussing. So, but it's more common than not uh, the deepest. Yeah, I mean, did you want to add something to the volcano? Because I saw your hand up. Uh, well, I'll just add something in, in terms of the vertical resolution question. I mean, so most of the climate models in CMIP-5 don't have 137 layers. I think the maximum was maybe 80. Um, but in our tests, uh, we're, I mean, our, our CMIP-6 runs will have like, you know, 96 to 100 layers. And uh, that's sufficient to self-generate a QBO. That makes a big difference to the tropostatic exchange in the tropics. And uh, we're seeing much better... Uh, ages of air, we're seeing much better stratotrope exchange of, um, you know, beryllium-7 and uh, nitrous oxides, which impact the chemistry, uh, and, and ozone in the southern hemisphere. Uh, and so it, it, it wasn't sufficient just to change the resolution. You have to fiddle around with some of the things that impact that. For instance, the gravity wave drag parameterization, that, that's, a, that's a key thing that you, that you really have to concentrate on. Uh, but you can get, uh, even within a climate model, uh, at you know, 90 to 100 levels, uh, really very good uh, stratospheric circulations, as long as, you know, and the lid has to be high enough as well. I mean, you can't do this with a lid at one millibar. It has to be at, you know, 0.1 or, or 0 0.0025 or something like that. Um, but you, you can get um, dramatically improved um, simulations uh, with, with not that much of a cost in terms of uh, computational time. Yeah, I mean, actually, I... If you can keep the microphone, I wanted to ask you because the question about volcanoes and uh, the tropical Pacific reminded me a question about solar in the tropical Pacific because I've just seen a recent paper that showed that uh, uh, the response to solar variability, and I, and I didn't read it in details to know what it is, uh, what the model is, that the response was entirely opposite to the response that uh, Jerry Meal got from the uh, Wacom model. In other words, when there is a maximum solar, uh, they tend to get an, an, an El Nino and not a La Nina that, uh, that Jerry showed that he's getting. So do you have something to say about your results in the tropical? I mean, that's something that I've looked at, and it's very ambiguous. I mean, we, we don't see any clear impact on, on ENSO variability. Uh, my, my gut feeling is that we still don't have enough of the right processes in the tropical Pacific at the right level of detail to be able to see a robust result. And I think that that, that goes over to you know, the huge diversity in responses to anthropogenic forcing in ENSO as well. I, I think we still have 
you know, we can get the amplitude uh, and, the, and the spectra about right, but I think we're, we may be overtuning our models so that uh, that is not uh, a sufficient um, uh, measure to demonstrate that we have skill in predicting how it's going to change under any kind of forcing, whether that's a, a strong volcano, whether it's solar, or whether it's anthropogenic uh, changes. If there are no other questions, we'll first of all thank Clara for joining us from, from Boulder. And uh, we can head on to the next item, which is, uh, what is it? Reception. Sorry, Clara, you cannot join us. <laughs> and the uh, poster session. So thanks again, everybody who spoke today and everybody who asked questions. Uh, and let's continue the same, the same spirit for tomorrow. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, Clara. Bye-bye. <clears throat>